Hi, my name is Natalie Tochi. Welcome to the Medication Administration Training. This training is required every three years. During this training, our objectives will include how to explain the importance of medication administration in a child care setting, responsibilities of parents, health care providers, and child care providers in promoting the safe administration of medication, review elements of best practice medication administration policy, explain the process of preparing, administrating, documenting, storing, and disposing of medications, describe appropriate techniques and approaches to administering medication to a young child, and differentiate the side effects and adverse reactions to medications and the appropriate responses. Let's talk about medications that you are allowed to give in childcare. These medications include oral, topical for your skin, eyes, ears, nose, inhalant medications such as your asthma medications, and pre-measured, commercially prepared injectable medications for emergencies such as your EpiPens. Now let's talk about medications that you're not allowed to give in daycare. This includes rectal medication, pre-measured, commercially prepared injectable medications not for emergencies or any other injectable medications. Investigational medications, uh, these are medications that are not approved by the FDA. That being said, there is a law that protects children with health care needs. This law is called the Americans with Disabilities Act, or the ADA. The ADA states that child care facilities must make reasonable modifications to their policies and practices to integrate children, parents, and guardians with disabilities into their program. So for example, let's say we have a child that has a seizure disorder, and because of their seizure disorder, they're required to have medication called diastaph. This is a rectal medication, and as you remember, we're not allowed to give rectal medications. But in this case, it would be given for an emergency. Therefore, we would have to provide all necessary means in order to allow this child to enter our daycare. In order to do this, we would need to petition the state. To petition the state, we require uh, information from your health care provider, from the parent, from your nurse. Trainings would need to be provided for the staff. Once all this is complete, the information is sent over to the state and we wait for written approval. If we receive written approval, the child can then attend childcare. Another example is a child who has diabetes. A diabetic child may need insulin injections, may have a diabetic pump, may require a finger poke to check their blood sugar levels. The parent plays a significant role in this training. The parent would come to the school, train the staff on how to work the diabetic monitor, how to give an insulin injection. The parent may also ask a nurse from their specialist to come in to help with the trainings. We will then provide all the information to the state, wait for written approval, and once we receive written approval, that child may attend childcare. Communication is very important uh, when it comes to child care. Uh, it is important to communicate with the parent and the health care provider. Parents' responsibilities are to provide documentation about their regular checkups, up-to-date immunizations, emergency contact phone numbers, and completing medication permission forms. Uh, they must consult with their health care provider about diagnosis or symptoms and care and completion of forms. Uh, they must share with the child care providers your own uh, medication policies. Um, they must also um, ask the prov health provider to um, give us information regarding their special health care needs through a health care plan or a um, medication form or a uh, health assessment form. Um, they need to talk to their doctor about whether or not a medication can be given at home because the less medication that you have to be responsible for, the better. 
Healthcare providers must complete all forms, must discuss medications with the parents, um, and can be discussed with you uh, with the parent permission. Uh, must adapt medication schedules so that if a medication can be given at home uh, once or twice a day, uh, then they can provide that uh, appropriate dosing. Um, and can help guide and educate us uh, to promote disease prevention and good health practices. Now, your responsibility as a child care provider is to make sure that all of these forms are filled out correctly. Sometimes the doctors don't have the appropriate forms, uh, so it is your responsibility that they're completed and they're signed. Your responsibility that the parents complete their portion of the form. Um, it is your responsibility to make sure that all medications are up to date, that all medication forms are up to date. Um, and that being said, there are certain medications that we would not expect you uh, to give. Um, one would be a medication that um, would require you to take a pulse or a blood pressure. Uh, you need to be medically trained to do that, and so therefore we would never expect you to learn how to do that. You know, not accept incomplete, illegible forms. Uh, make sure that those forms are correct. If they're not correct, you will not be able to accept the medication or the, the form. Uh, make sure that you have had your special training if it is a special health care need child. Um, and you're not allowed to give a medication if medication hasn't been uh, given written consent by the parent um, or if the parent is asking inappropriate requests. One inappropriate request would be something like a parent tells you they have Tylenol in a child's backpack uh, for you to give just in case they develop a fever or they're cranky. You're not allowed to give any medications without the medication form. Other inappropriate requests would be non-essential medications. So we talked about having the least amount of medications in your daycare. So if medication is only supposed to be given once or twice a day, um, then that can be given at home. If it's a medication such as vitamins, those are not for emergencies and can be given at home. Um, if medication wasn't authorized by the doctor, so if you don't have an administration authorization form, you may not administer the medication. If the medication is off-label, so if they give you a prescription medication that has no pharmacy label, you are not allowed to give that medication. The other medications that we don't uh, recommend giving is cough and cold medications for young children under six years of age. Uh, if a child is that sick and requires cough or cold medications, they should remain at home. Uh, now, if a parent would like to come to the daycare to administer medication, that is fine. Um, but you should not be administering medication if you don't have an authorization form and if you have not been specially trained to uh, give this medication. Now, how does the parent know what your practice uh, requires? It is important to have a medication policy on hand. This medication policy uh, should be reviewed by the parents and signed by the parents. Information can include things like who will be giving medication? What type of medication will you be giving? Where will medication be given and stored? When will medication be given? how confidentiality will be maintained. Some schools prefer only to give emergency medications. Therefore, you should state this in your medication policy so parents are aware that they don't or can't bring in Tylenol or Motrin just in case. There are two different categories of medications. Uh, one is prescription. The other is over-the-counter. Prescription medications are prescribed by a doctor, uh, needs to be filled by a pharmacist or a doctor. Um, over-the-counter medications uh, you can pick up right at your pharmacy. Uh, these include fever-reducing medications such as Tylenol or Motrin, uh, antihistamines like Benadryl, 
hydrocortisone, lycordate, uh, nasal drops or saline sprays. Those are, can all be um, bought at uh, the pharmacy. Other kinds of medications are homeopathic medications, which we tend not to um, want to give to children only because uh, they haven't really been studied. And so we don't know the effects that they will have in children. Just because something says that they are natural doesn't mean it makes it safe. Now, medications uh, have both brand and generic names. So for example, uh, Tylenol is a brand name. The generic name of Tylenol is acetaminophen. Benadryl is a brand name. The generic name for Benadryl is diphenhydramine. It is important when you're looking at authorization forms that the medication matches the forms. Therefore, if a doctor writes on the form Benadryl, the parent must bring you the brand name Benadryl. If the doctor wrote Benadryl and the mom brings you diphenhydramine, even though it's the same exact medication, it's not acceptable. It's a lot easier to ask the parent to bring you a brand new medication than to have the doctor fill out a brand new form. Um, another type of documentation that you'll need and is very important is the health assessment form. The health assessment form is where the doctor is going to indicate any special health care need. So for example, they will write if they're asthmatic or if they have allergies if they require an EpiPen, if they have seizure disorders. Now, if the doctor does indicate that the child does have special health care needs, you will always need to have a care plan. There could be a care plan for asthma. There will be a care plan for allergies. Um, there will also be a care plan for seizures. So anything that uh, will require you to pay special attention if that child gets sick. There are a couple of different forms of care plans. One is an individual plan of care for children with special health care needs. This can be directly downloaded from the OEC. This can be filled out either by you or your nurse and would be signed by the parent. All care plans need to be signed by all staff members. Um, this includes uh, even staff members that may not be in the classroom. The reason why this is is because the state wants you to be aware of anybody in the building that may have a special health care need. So for example, if you're walking down the hall, you should know that little Joey may have a seizure disorder. Or another example is if you're in the classroom, the state enters, and you are a floater. It's not your typical classroom. The state might ask you, does this classroom have any medications? Your answer should never be, I don't know. You should always be familiar of what medications and what special health care needs you have in your classroom. Other documentations that are required. So whenever you have a medication, you must always have an authorization medication form. This form is filled out by the doctor. It is signed by the parent. If it is a special health care need, you need a care plan. The other type of form that you will need and should be prepared when you receive the medication is an MAR. That is your medication administration record. Your MAR is the form that you document when you give a medication but you should always have the top portion and the bottom portion already filled out when you receive the medication. The top portion indicates the child's name, the date of birth, pharmacy, prescription number, and the name of the medication. If it is a prescription, you will have a pharmacy label. This label will indicate the pharmacy name and prescription number. If it is an over-the-counter medication like Benadryl, you do not need to write the prescription number or pharmacy name. The bottom part of the form is a great checkoff list to make sure that you have everything you need. One, you're checking off that your authorization form is complete 
and signed. Two, you're checking that your medication is in its original box. They cannot give you just a medication. It needs to be in its original box. Make sure that the labels are current, which means you want to make sure that your medication is not expired. Make sure the medication is appropriately labeled. If it is a prescription, it must have a pharmacy label. If it is an over-the-counter medication, you must write the child's name on the bottle. The medication should also be in an unopened box. So for example, Benadryl needs to be in an unopened box and sealed. You cannot accept a medication that is opened and used. Reason being is because if that medication has been tampered with and you give the medication to the child and the child gets sick, you're now liable. So please accept all new medications from the parent. Now, any medications that are for non-prescription over-the-counter preparations. So these are actually your creams that you will be administrating to the child. Um, this form is filled out by the parent. The form is only for non-active medications. That means it's creams that have no medications in them. This can include creams such as diaper creams, teething preparations, lip preparations, sunscreen, bug spray, lotions. Um, you cannot use this form for creams that contain medication in them, such as antibiotic ointments, such as Neosporin or Bacitracin, antifungal creams like Lotrimin, which is often used for children who have yeast infections, steroid creams, which is often used for children who have eczema. Uh, this can be something like hydrocortisone or Cordaid. Those have medications in them. So therefore, you require a doctor's authorization form. When the parent fills out a topical form, they're signing, and what they're signing is that they have administered this cream once before. You never want to administer a cream for the very first time in your daycare in case the child has a reaction. I've noticed quite a few times that the form is filled out incorrectly. Uh, it is important that when you are writing the schedule of administration, you do not write as needed. You must have something specific. So it can be said at every diaper change, or if there's a rash, or 30 minutes before going outside for sunscreen. The other area that I find that is incorrect is that parents will write um, instead of a date, the start date and end date, they'll write to the child from the teacher. It must be a date. It must be a start and end date. And I recommend using a full year. So for example, if your school year is September to September, make that your full year. It could be January to January. Uh, if a child starts mid-year, like let's say they start in April and you renew all your forms in September, it should state from April to September. Therefore, your forms will never expire throughout the year. Any cream that is applied, you must document. So you must document on your MAR. So every time that you change a diaper and you apply diaper cream, you must document. Every time you apply sunscreen, you must document. This is to cover yourselves. So I use this as an example a lot. Say little Johnny comes to daycare and he has no diaper rash. He leaves daycare with a diaper rash. Even though you've changed his diaper appropriately and you used cream, he still has a diaper rash. Kids get diaper rashes all the time. They can have a diaper rash when they're teething. They can have a diaper rash if they've had a loose stool or a different food they ate. It happens. So the parent, when picks up the child, says, 
what happened? You must not have applied the diaper cream. He has a diaper rash. You can then pull out your MAR and say, yes, I did apply the cream. I applied it at such and such a times and I have it documented here. That covers yourself. So always document whatever you put on. If it's not documented, then there's no proof and they can say that you have not applied the cream. Now, when you're receiving medications and you're accepting this medication, review the medication, review the forms, uh, make sure that all documentation is correct. Uh, make sure that the medication that you have is correct. Make sure that you um, have all the signatures. Uh, many, many times there is medications, uh, forms that are missing signatures or dates. Um, if you are in a practice with a nurse consultant, sometimes nurse consultants will ask you, to leave the medication uh, in the office and let them review it before it enters your classrooms to double check to make sure that all the medication is correct and all your forms are completed. So now let's talk about uh, how to administer medication safely. To administer medication safely, follow your five rights. Um, this includes make sure you're giving it to the right child, the right medication, the right dose, the right route, the right time. There are other two other rights that you can check and is it would be right reason to give the medication or indication of why you're giving the medication and make sure that you have the right documentation in your MAR. This will help you prevent a medication error. You never want to ask a child, so what's your name? Because that on that day, they might be Superman or Tinkerbell. Um, so a good way to help you determine these five rights is keep all your medications in a Ziploc bag. Keep the medications, the forms, emergency contact, and a child's picture on the bag to help indicate that you are grabbing the right medication. Before giving a medication, you're going to always want to wash your hands with soap and water for 20 seconds and wear gloves. You'll want to wash your hands after you removed your gloves um, when after you've given the medication. Make sure that you have the appropriate tools to give the medication. So if it's an oral medication and you're given a bottle of Benadryl, and Benadryl needs to be given to a nine-month-old. Benadryl bottles usually only come in calibrated cups. A nine-month-old is not going to be able to drink out of that cup. Therefore, it's your job to ask the parent to bring you appropriate devices. That could be a um, dropper. It could be a syringe. It could be a dosing spoon. Um, or for older kids, uh, a calibrated measuring cup. You will never ever use a kitchen teaspoon to administer medication. That would be the inappropriate dose to give medications. Um, parents should always provide you with the supply of preferred measuring devices. And uh, you're going to want to wash the measuring device after each use. Medications and food. You never want to mix a medication with uh, your food or liquids unless it is um, ordered by the doctor to do so. Um, if you put medication in someone's bottle and they don't drink the whole bottle, uh, they will not have gotten their full dose. Um, so you must always make sure that um, if it is prescribed uh, to be given medication with food and liquids that you follow the directions very carefully. If a child vomits or spits up their medication, you don't want to give that medication um, back again. Uh, you will want to contact the parent and so they can contact the doctor to determine whether or not that dose should be held or if it can be repeated. Now, when we talk about uh, medications for 
the skin. So if you are applying creams, make sure that you're wearing gloves, make sure that you are washing your hands. Uh, if you're applying eye drops, one quick trick if a child does not want to open their eyes, so for example, they're keeping their eyes nice and tight and closed, you can dispense that drop on the corner of the eye, and when they open their eye, that drop will seep in. Uh, I have used that trick many, many times with my own children. Uh, nose drops or nose sprays, so the child should always be laying down flat. If it's a nose spray, you're going to want to cover one nose, nostril, and spray, cover the other nostril, and spray. If it's nose drops, you'll just want to tilt the head back to drop the drops in the nostrils. Eardrops. So with eardrops, the child should always be laying flat with the affected ear facing up. If it's a child under three, you're going to want to pull that earlobe down and back. If it's a child over three, you're going to want to pull that earlobe up and back. Uh, this will help the drops seep into the ear canal um, better. Uh, they'll want to stay laying down just to help those drops go into the ear canal. Now we're going to discuss uh, an emergency that uh, probably will happen most frequently, and that's asthma. Asthma is a chronic inflammatory condition of the airways and passages. It causes your muscles in your airway to tighten and to narrow. It can cause inflammation or swelling of the airway, uh, and it can cause excess mucus or production. A couple of asthma triggers can be air pollution, allergies to pollen, mold spores, animal dander, dust mites, even cockroach droppings. So let's take uh, allergy season, for example, if somebody's allergic to pollen and it causes them to have a runny nose or a cough, this can trigger their asthma. Another type of asthma is what we call viral induced asthma, so respiratory infections. So whenever somebody gets a cold or a cough, this can cause inflammation in their lungs and cause them to have an asthma attack. For older children, they can develop exercise-induced asthma. If there are smokers in the home, that can trigger somebody's asthma. Strong uh, emotions like uh, excessive laugh, ha hard laughing or hard crying can actually trigger asthma. Um, strong odors, so if somebody is wearing a very strong perfume, that can cause somebody to start to wheeze and cause an asthma attack. And lastly, the cold, dry air. So on a winter day when it's really, really cold and dry um, and a person steps outside, that might trigger their asthma. So what are the signs and symptoms of asthma? Uh, you can see coughing. And it's not just uh, a simple cough. It's a cough that sounds very dry and very persistent. Wheezing, which is a very high-pitched sound when they're breathing. Shortness of breath their change in behavior. Uh, they can be anxious, so it, it, it's very scary for a child who is having trouble breathing. Uh, inability to speak complete sentences. They can have tightness in the chest. They can have labored breathing, and labored breathing is when you look at their stomach, their ribs are going in and out really fast. Nasal flaring or grunting with each breath. Um, and then if their lips or nail beds are turning blue, that means there's, there's lack of oxygen. Um, so asthma is um, a, an emergency, and if not treated, it can cause frequent absences in childcare. It can cause parents to miss work. Um, it can cause frequent doctor visits or emergency visits. It can cause permanent lung damage. And if they don't have their asthma medication, it could even cause death. So it is important that if we do have a child uh, who has asthma, that we have the appropriate medication and appropriate forms. Any child 
that is diagnosed with asthma must have an asthma care plan. So you will find this information on the child health care form. The doctor may check off that they have asthma and what type of asthma they have. Um, unfortunately, they don't always check off whether they need medication in childcare, even though there is a space there for them to check off. Uh, if they check off that they have asthma and they don't check off that they need medication, it is our responsibility to find that out. Um, so the nurse can either email the parent to get that information from the doctor or call the doctor's office and get that information. If the child does not need asthma medication, you still need to have an asthma care plan. You must be aware of any child that has any type of asthma. Let's say they don't need medication, but this year, for some reason, they develop really bad colds and all of a sudden they need their asthma medicine. You're gonna listen for those symptoms. You're listening for wheezing, uh, the type of cough, their constant cough, their difficulty breathing. Um, and that should sort of uh, give you an idea that, um, you know, this child has used asthma medications in the past, may never have used it in daycare, but needs it now. So you will need to call the parent um, and they would need to be seen by the doctor. Um, and if the doctor felt that they needed medication while in childcare, then that medicine must be brought to us in order for the child to attend. There are two forms of medication. There is your rescue medication, which is what you should be responsible for. And there's your daily medication uh, or your preventative medication. Your daily medication or preventative medication is given just once or twice a day. Therefore, it should be given at home. Your rescue medication is your medication that you give while they're coughing or wheezing, so while they're having the symptoms. This medication helps decrease the wheezing, helps you breathe better, opens up your airways. It's usually given every four to six hours as needed. Um, once you have your medication form and your asthma care plan, which remember needs to be signed by the doctor the parent, and all staff members. You'll also get your MAR ready so that all the forms are complete and ready for you to administer medications. The medications does come in several different forms. Um, for children, usually over two, we'll have a inhaler and a spacer. This is an example of a spacer. This is an example of a medication with pharmacy label. This is your inhaler. You would remove your cap from your inhaler. You would place the inhaler in your spacer. Shake your inhaler. Place the mask against the face. Press the canister and let them breathe for a count of 10 seconds. While they're doing this, the medication remains in the arrow chamber. Therefore, they're getting the full effect of the medication. That was one puff. It's usually prescribed two puffs. So let them breathe a few breaths and do the process all over again. If a child is a baby and they require a nebulizer, this is a machine that is, can be purchased or be rented by the doctors. You will also have um, tubing that attaches to the machine and attaches to the cup. The medication is then dispensed into the cup. So you will have a vial pre-filled. Dispense the medication in the cup. Put the cap back on. You can either put this against the child's head, around the child's head, or against the child's face. Um, they usually don't like the band, so if you can, you can hold it for them. Um, the medication must be kept upright like this. If you hold it like this, 
none of the medication will come out. So it is important that you keep it upright. Therefore, a child or a baby should either be sitting upright in your lap, or you could sit them in a car seat buckled in, or a high chair buckled in. Uh, they tend not to like this, especially if they're not feeling well, and so they might cry. Crying is not a bad thing. When they're crying, they are taking deeper breaths. Therefore, they're getting a fuller effect of the medication. Um, this medication usually uh, can take about 15 to 20 minutes to finish. When you know it's done, there's no more steam that comes out of the medication. You're going to want to wash your cup and your mask in soapy water, then rinse it carefully and let it air dry on a paper towel. Never dry the cup or the mask with the paper towel because the little threads that are from the paper towel will get stuck in the cup and the next time around they will inhale it. So always air dry your mask and your cup. Make sure that you check your five rights before you give the medication. So let's remember our five rights is the right child, the right dose, the right medication, the right route at the right time. Make sure that you keep your medication in a Ziploc bag with all forms, emergency contact, and a picture of the child. Medications should always remain at daycare. The nebulizer machine, on the other hand, can be a device that goes back and forth. Um, unfortunately, though, is if the parent forgets the machine the next day and the child will require a dose, the child can't stay. Um, so many schools have decided to purchase their own nebulizers to have at their center so that they don't get cited for not having the appropriate equipment um, to dispense the medication. Um, these medications are for emergency purposes. Therefore, they must be uh, kept in a unlocked area that's accessible to you, but not accessible to children. Again, if you are a floater or if this is a new classroom for you, please be familiar with any child that has asthma and has a medication in your classroom. Know where it is kept and stored. If you do not have um, medications, um, so if a child forgets their asthma or their form expires, they are not allowed to be in your center until the appropriate medications and forms are brought in. The medication for asthma uh, can cause some side effects. Um, those children who are accustomed to having their medication usually doesn't phase them, but for those that may be new to them, can cause hyperactivity, it can cause tremors, a dry mouth, sore throat, dizziness, nauseous, appetite changes. And so a child that has possibly been given a nebulizer right before nap time uh, may have a hard time staying on their cot or going to sleep. They might be a little extra hyperactive. Um, this is normal and um, hopefully short-lived for you. Um, if you do make a medication error, so if you give uh, the medication to a wrong child or the wrong medication or wrong dose, wrong time, wrong route. So basically, it's all your five rights that have gone wrong. You're going to want to fill out a medication incident report. Uh, you must uh, contact the parent to let them know um, that a medication error has happened. We may need to contact or notify um, the doctor for guidance. If the child seems in any distress, you must call 911. Um, and um, you will definitely need to notify your program director. 
uh, a form must be filled out if there is a medication error. Hopefully, with filling out your MARs and going through your five rights before you give your medication, this will help prevent you from causing uh, yourself to have a medication error. Now, when should I call 911 um, with a child with asthma? So if a child is showing signs of distress and uh, you've given the medication and they haven't improved within 20 minutes, you're going to want to call 911. Uh, if a child loses consciousness, if they have a seizure activity, if they are turning blue with difficulty breathing, even after you've given uh, their medication, uh, if they're having trouble swallowing, um, or if they're getting worse very quickly, you're going to want to call 911. Um, it can be, changes can be made very quickly. Uh, a child can go from wheezing to trouble breathing to not breathing at all very, very fast. So it is really important that they have their medication and we monitor them after they have their medication. Uh, disposing of our medication. So uh, as a nurse, I try to inform parents one month before their medication expires. Therefore, it gives them extra time to either go to the pharmacy or call their doctor. Um, maybe they need a doctor's appointment. So it gives them enough time to get uh, a new prescription. Um, and that goes with the medication forms as well. Um, we want to give them a month prior uh, to when they expire to give them enough time to return the medication or forms. Let's say it's a family that has left your center um, and they did not uh, bring their medication and you've tried to call them. Uh, if they do not pick up the medication within seven days, you can dispose of it. Uh, you do want to be careful on how you dispose medications. Uh, speak to your nurse consultant before you do so. This way they are disposed appropriately. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me. Uh, I would be happy to answer uh, any questions regarding this training. Uh, there will be a short quiz that you will need to take and send back to me. Uh, once I receive this quiz, um, I will then visit your center to help uh, demonstrate or re-demonstrate uh, how to use an inhaler and a nebulizer. Again, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. My name is Natalie Tojan. Thank you.